a warm welcome to this discussion session. I think it is time we had a discussion with some of our teaching associates who would like to raise a few points and a few questions as there are some tricky concepts that we have been discussing over the last few sessions. Maybe I will go over to the teaching associates and they will tell you the questions and the points that they have. So, over to you. Hello sir, uh, we had discussed about the concept of implicit and explicit functions. So, uh, is it possible to relate uh, it to a, a practical example that is implicit functions where are they used in the real life examples? Yeah, that is a good question. Now, let us look at the same example that we began with. If you look at the description there, the RC circuit for example, we took the output y of t which is the output voltage here and the input x of t which is the input voltage and we saw that the output is related to the input in the following way y t plus r times the current c d y t d t is the input. Now, here this is an implicit relation between the input and the output and in fact many relationships are like this they are implicit. One cannot read off you know read off so to speak y t from x t. What I mean by that is that you know I cannot explicitly say well y t can be calculated from the x t's in the following way. I cannot put down a formula where y t is on one side of the equation and x t and I mean x t means x t at all time is on the other that is explicit. So, let me give you an example of an explicit relation y t is let us say d x t d t very clear the output is the derivative of the input as clear as crystal. So, I can read off y t from x t time by time I cannot do that in this R c circuit I need to do some work I need to solve it. Now, in fact that is where this idea of the response of that R c circuit to a very narrow pulse comes into the picture. So, what I do is I say well if the R c circuit if you give a very narrow pulse give a very narrow pulse let the width of the pulse be delta or any multiple of delta for that matter and the same multiple of delta comes here 1 by delta I mean this is a very narrow pulse give this as the input to the R c circuit. So, it is a hypothetical voltage which you are giving to the R c circuit and you record the output let that output be h of t. The beauty is we will show later that we can write y t explicitly in terms of x t and h t provided delta goes towards 0. So, in a way what we are going to do in the next few sessions is to make this evident to ourselves that many real life problems give you implicit relationships, but you want the relationship to be explicit. So, you need to do some work once and that work suffices to make that relationship explicit for you for all possible x t. We are going to talk about the response to an impulse. I hope that answers your question. Do you have some other observations? We discussed in the lecture uh, lectures uh, the shifting property. Uh, I think uh, I have a, a way to illustrate it. So, uh, can yes. I just show it to you and you can comment on it whether it is good or bad? Very good. That is very nice to hear. So, in fact, the shifting property is a very important idea in the context of an impulse and Sushrut says that he has a much better way to illustrate this or a clear illustrative example. So, let me now invite Sushrut to put his example before you and let us see how he does in terms of illustrating this in a much better way. Yes, welcome Sushrut, please come. So, here is Sushrut before me and he is now going to illustrate the idea of sifting in a much better way. Yes, Sushrut, why do not you tell us what you are going to do? So, uh what am I going to do is uh, I'll take an example uh, which is e raise to minus t, and I'll take an impulse, and I'll uh, go through the process of how uh, we reached uh, at the conclusion that 
the value of the function uh, at the point uh, where the impulse lies comes out. So, he is going to illustrate the shifting property to you with a reasonably good example and you know actually going through the math carefully, yes. So, uh, here we have uh, a function e raise to uh, minus t. So, this is 1 and this is the function uh, somewhat and uh, then we have uh, this pulse. I am choosing it at uh, 1, we can choose at anywhere else. I am just keeping it, uh, it is with delta right now. So, the height will be 1 by delta and uh, then now we need to multiply these two. So, uh, after multiplication, uh, the part outside the delta function uh, will be reduced to 0 because uh, delta function is uh, only a finite value between uh, 1 minus delta by 2 and 1 plus delta by 2. In fact, so should let us illustrate that with a color. So, let me help you with that. So, you could actually take let us say put this pulse here. So, this is t equal to 1 here, is not it? Hmm. So, you could put the pulse here, let us put it like this. Yeah. And you are centering the pulse at 1, are not you? Yeah. Yeah. So, that means this point would be 1 minus delta by 2. Yes. And this point would be 1 plus delta by 2. Hmm. And the height would be 1 by delta. Yeah. So, now you put it on the same one. And what you are saying is that what is outside the red box goes away. Yes. So, perhaps we could illustrate that below, huh. you know. So, we could just say you have this left here, teeny weeny piece like that left. Yes. Yeah. Now, you can go on. So, uh, we see that uh, the there is some uh, difference of uh, values between the two extremities. So, uh, we will just go ahead with that and uh, then we will make the pulse narrower uh, as we go on. So, we will just. So, let us just multiply them, right? So, huh. let us just calculate the integral. Huh, okay. Let us just, just calculate, calculate the integral. integral. So, e raise the power minus t multiplied by this over all time. So, then that boils so, down to 1 minus delta by 2. And the value of delta is uh, 1 by delta between these two points. That is very So, uh, we can go ahead like this and delta is a constant uh, with respect to t. That's so, correct. it comes out. So, uh, it will be minus e raise to minus t with the limits uh, 1 plus delta by 2 and uh, 1 minus delta by 2. So, it was uh, 1 by delta times uh, e raise to minus 1 minus delta by 2 minus e raise to minus 1 plus delta by 2. That is correct. I think that is it. Huh. So, uh, we can again draw the figure. It was looking something like this. So, when we make the pulse narrower and narrower, uh, the height difference between the two extremities uh, will be reducing and uh, it will finally be something like this almost. So, uh, we can see uh, that uh, y component of this pulse is almost constant and uh, if we put that uh, in this in the equation we have uh, that is uh, take limit delta tending to, to 0, uh, we will find the area uh, of this function. So, let us do that. And we can take e raise to minus one common from both of these, and it it will also come out uh, come out of the limit uh, because uh, it is not dependent on uh, capital delta. Very good. That's now now you know you can tell them how you calculate this limit. Huh. So uh, it is of the form uh, zero by zero if we directly substitute uh, delta equal to zero. So maybe you can use uh, L'Hopital's rule and uh, take derivative on both sides uh, right. and the limit will not change. So, it will be and now we can directly substitute delta equal to 0. Very good. So, L'Hopital's so, rule gives you a very convenient expression, yes. It is uh, e raise to minus 1 or 1 by e. Very good. So, that is how uh, you can go through the process and uh, because we uh, drew it graphically, it is much more intuitive than just the mathematical part. So, in fact, here it clearly illustrates to you with a simple example how this impulse sifts out. You know, so the word shifting actually suggests what is done in the word shifting means 
to identify small particles, you know when you sift out, sifting in, in grains, for example, people sift grains, so they identify small little contents in the grain and sifting here really means identifying that particular value of x t at the point where the impulse lies, bringing that out, taking that out of all the sand lying around it, so to speak. Very nice, Sushrut, very good, that is a very nice illustration. I invite all the participants of this course to construct such examples for themselves to understand the sifting property better. This idea of impulse and the way impulses come together to construct a continuous function needs to be understood very well to appreciate the subsequent discussions of the course. Thank you, Sushrut. Thank very you, well. sir. So, do we have any other questions on the topics that we have talked about so far? Uh, sir, you just explained about the direct delta function uh, it, and it seems to be a very important concept in signals and systems. I just wanted to ask if it is also a very important concept in some other fields of physics or probably mathematics. For example, I have heard that it may be used in say discrete probability densities or something like that. Could you just elaborate on that? Yes, that is a very important question. In fact, in a way the Dirac delta as we are going to talk about the impulse is one way to bring in a connection between what you call continuous variable, continuous random variable densities and discrete random variable densities. Let me illustrate to you with an example. So, for example, many of you are familiar with what we call the Gaussian density, you know, or the normal distribution. Looks something like this. There is a mean here. And of course, the expression if the mean is at t equal to t 0 and t is the random variable, then it looks like e raised to the power minus t minus t 0 squared by 2 sigma squared divided by an appropriate constant. Let us not get into that for the moment. The constant depends on sigma. Now, this is of course, what you call p t, you know. So, now you could call t the random variable and p t at a particular value t. This is the probability density function of the random variable t. Of course, you know to be very careful, I should use a different name for the random variable and the value. So, maybe I will write t 1 here if you really want to do that, but that is besides the point. The point is if I take a particular value t equal to t 1 and ask what is the probability that that random variable will take on that particular value? The answer is always 0. So, what is the probability that this Gaussian or the normal random variable will take on a value t equal to 5? Although the density is non 0 at 5, the value of the probability is always 0. On the other hand, if you ask me what is the probability that that random variable would take a value between 5 and 5.5. I can calculate, I can integrate the area under that probability density and that gives me the probability. And of course, that area has to be less than 1 because this density integrates to 1. Now, in contrast, suppose I am talking about a fair die, right. So, one fair die, so which has 6 faces, 1 to 6, let us say. What is the probability that the die shows? 3, it is 1 by 6 of course. How do we represent this on the random variable space? So, you have the random variable here equal to the value shown by the die and that can take discrete values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. How do I write a density here? I would write a density here by putting impulses at each of these places. I would put a Dirac delta here. Each impulse would have a strength of 1 by 6. So, I need to bring in, you know, now I can ask what is the probability that the die takes on one particular value, because you can integrate the impulse captures an area, a non-zero area into zero length. So, what is the area contained at the point 3? The answer is 1 by 6. So, the idea of the Dirac delta is very important in going from continuous densities to discrete densities. That is the answer to your question.